I'm getting close to finishing the checkering on this old 1903 A3 stock here. And I am getting excited about this. And I can't wait to see what this is going to look like when we're done. But I thought that I would stop for just a moment to take a look at checker. Because that's something we don't talk much about. We don't see much about it. And most of us don't know much about the process of checkering. So before I get this finished and all cleaned up, I thought we'd just take a look at the tools we need, how it's done, and the process behind it. And along with some of the issues we can run into while doing it. Hand cut checkering is a dying art form. And I hate to say that, but it is. It's almost non-existent now. Very few even know what it is. And I do hate to see that because it, it adds a unique character to a rifle stock that, or any gun stock that you just don't get this with machine cut checkering or laser etch checkering or press checkering, any of that. With hand cut checkering, it's unique. It's as unique as the piece of wood that the checkering is put into. And I just, you can see it in the checkering when you look at it. All right, and for me as someone out here in my shop that enjoys just making things, I really do appreciate the aesthetics I get with hand cut checker. And my inspiration for this was the rifles from the early 1900s, the Griffin and Howells, the Holland and Hollands, the Rigby's, so many of the fine rifles from that time, they all had hand cut checker. Now keep in mind, those were very expensive rifles. Not many people could afford those. Very few people could afford those at that time, and that was a luxury item, the checkering on the stocks, the hand-cut checkering. But when you look at those stocks, there's just something unique about them that just stands out, and that's a big part of it, it's that hand-cut checkering. That's part of what gives them that character. All right. What today, very few of us now could afford to buy a stock that's has hand cut checkering. That's something in the realm of custom rifles now, and that's it. There are no production rifles anymore with hand cut checkering. They're doing everything with either press checkering that this looks horrible, and most now though are using CNC equipment or laser burning or something like that, an automated process to do the checkering. On what few wooden stocks remain on new factory rifles, so for overwhelming majority of us, if we want to hand cut checkering in a stock, we're going to have to do it ourselves. Fortunately though, it's not that difficult. But I will say, hand cut checkering, the process of cutting the checkering in by hand, it is maddening. <laughs> it is excruciatingly tedious work. And the process itself is simple. We're scratching a lot of little lines in the wood. But it's worth it. And as I look at this stock down, I'm proud of the work I'm seeing here. And that's the thing about checkering it. As you're doing it, as you're going through the process of the checkering, you slowly see your unique patterns start to emerge from the wood and that's what motivates you. Because checkering, it, it's just a repeated pattern. Most of the things we do that are have a repeated pattern to them, once we develop the muscle memory, our minds can just kind of go on cruise control and wonder and think about all sorts of things while our hands just keep doing, you know, over and over and over till we're done. With checkering, you have to remain completely 100% focused on every single line and as soon as you lose focus for just a second your cutter's just going to go off out in the left field and you're just going to completely mar what you have <laughs> so yes it is maddening and it's tedious but the tougher it gets the more time you've spent on it that pattern's emerging the whole time you're doing it and, it and that really makes it worth it and that's when you 
truly begin to appreciate the checkering itself. All right, so let's take a, a quick look at exactly how this is done on a rifle. The most important part of checkering by far is just choosing your pattern. And by pattern, I mean, what is the outline, the border of your checkering gonna look like? On this stock here, I've got a single panel here on the pistol grip. I've got a single panel on this pistol grip and it doesn't wrap around. Some of the patterns completely wrap around with the checkering on the pistol grips. For the fore end, I've got a five point pattern, very traditional pattern of five points on the front and then five points at the rear. And with this particular pattern, I left a diamond in the center. For me, that just added a really nice touch to this stock. And this is very similar to a lot of the older rifles that I mentioned earlier. Well, a lot of the older rifles, they would have a screw right here that the barrels had barrel bands on them and then the screw would come through and help hold the stock to the rifle. They didn't have just the two action screws like so many rifles now. Well, oftentimes where that screw was, that custom gun makers would leave a diamond around that screw. It's just, it was a nice touch. And that's what inspired me to want to leave this diamond. There's tons of things you can do, carvings you can add, ribbons you could put through here, floor to lease and the pistol grips. So just so many options. Spend the time though to really look at different patterns and figure out exactly what you want to do because uh, the effort you spend in studying the patterns is going to really pay off in the finished product as far as getting what you want. And with that said, most of the work we do checkering is wearing a magnifying lens, visor. This is very small work and this visor completely changes our perspective while we're doing this. Okay, when we put this visor on and we've got the lighting just perfect and we're looking at every individual diamond in these patterns. All right, so we're looking at the trees, not the forest. Well, when we take this visor off, all of a sudden we're looking at the forest, the overall pattern. And that's something to, to keep in mind when you're checkering, especially when we're wearing this, we can see details that just, I mean, just gorgeous details in the diamonds and their shape and the cut. At the same time, we make mistakes, overcuts, bad cuts, you name it, we do it. And they look horrible while we're wearing this. I mean, it looks like, oh no, I just completely ruined my whole project. Then you take this off and you can't even see the mark. <laughs> so, <laughs> perspective is everything on this. But at the end of the day, when you're finished, you're not gonna see those individual diamonds. You're not gonna see most of the mistakes. As a matter of fact, that's a lot of what we're fixing to do now is just clean up the mistakes on here so that they're about to disappear, which is why I wanted to do this now, while they're still here and I can show them. Right. Get that pattern right though, because in the end, that's what you're gonna be left with. All right, now once the pattern's done, all right, you, you've decided what you want on a pattern. For the, the single panel on the pistol grip here, I drew this out by hand. And parts of it look really good, parts of it don't until I did it by hand. I'm pretty symmetrical on each side. One thing I did notice that, okay, when we do the pattern, I used a China marker and I do not have it right here. Okay, China marker or a grease marker is handy because you can put a mark on the stock and you're not leaving an indention in the wood like you might with an actual pencil. All right, so this cleaning up's not an issue, it's just gonna literally just wipe right off. So 
I went over the outline of my panels on the pistol grip with the china marker. And then I came back in with a pocket knife and cut those. And I've also got a marking knife in the cabinet here that I used on some. But it's very difficult getting the, your, your first cuts. That's the hardest part of checkering is those first cuts. And the straight areas, I could use a straight edge. You're going to want a flexible straight edge. And the reason for flexible is you want it to be able to wrap around the curves and bends and the, the stock. It, these lines here, even though they're going over all kinds of curved surfaces, we still want them perfectly straight. Pocket knife or a marking knife, you can follow that edge, you get a straight cut. With the curved cuts though, it's something you're just going to have to figure it out. And in my case, I did, but I did notice in this one area, right here, my curves aren't quite what they should be. They're, they're getting a little flat in a couple spots. And it's something most people would never notice. Just, and you really look at the details when you're doing this, and I notice it. This side, I nailed it. And the symmetry between them is spot on. All right. Things in particular you want to pay attention to is making sure the bottom of your pattern is the same on each side as far as like here from, from the bottom of the pistol grip. Right, so I got the same distance here, same spacing. And then for myself, I've mentioned this book quite a bit in the past, Modern Gunsmith by James V. Howe of Griffin and Howe. Excellent resource, and he's got a in-depth section on checkering. And this is, I use this, first of all, to help pick out my pattern because you've got quite a few patterns to choose from. And I knew I wanted to create a pattern similar to a Griffin and Howe. I, I'm never gonna be able to afford a Rigby or a Holland and Holland or a Griffin and Howe, but I can make something that looks similar. That's so that's part of what this project is for me. And hey, we're, we're heading in that direction. Right, so I used, went through and looked at his patterns. And I also looked at the pattern on this Winchester Model 70 Featherweight Super Grade stock here, which by the way is also five points and front and back. A very traditional pattern. Several five point patterns in here, been around forever. But one thing that James House said in here that I, I really took to heart that I thought was probably the most useful thing, and I'm paraphrasing here, but you want symmetry from the front to the back. All right, so if there's, if you've got two visible points here, then two visible points on the rear pattern. All right, that way you've got symmetry. You, you want this to match this. You want your spacing here from the bottom of the pistol grip to match the spacing from the top of the stock here down. So that's, that's a big thing. It's just getting that symmetry so that the, you don't want completely different style patterns on the pistol grip and the forehand. Now, after once you decide what you want, though, there are all kinds of options, though, as far as things we can do. And that's just what I chose using that and this stock for inspiration. For the forend, I actually drew out my pattern on graphing paper. Right, well, we've got a lot of angles we're working with here, and Angles are a big part of your diamonds. This is a layout tool for checkering. We've got a different angle on this end than this end. On this end, we have three to one. On this end, three and a half to one. And all that means is this, if we were to make this into a triangle, the base of this triangle on the three to one, the base would be the height would be three times taller than the base is wide. 
on the three and a half to one, the height of the triangle would be three and a half times taller than the base is wide. So the three and a half to one would give you a narrower diamond or a smaller angle. Three to one wider diamond, wider angle. You don't have to follow this, it's just tradition. All right. What that factored into me laying out my pattern here as far as my angles and so forth. And that's something you're going to have to play with. All right. Once you get your pattern down, then you have to, you're going to have to cut in your border. That's the hardest part. Knife and straight edge for the straight sections. And for me, I actually taped my pattern to the stock here and followed parts of it. And you don't want the points deep because they're not necessarily going to end up where you have it laid out. You, you're going to have to make alterations depending on how the lines flow in this, that, and another. But where this is important is for our master lines. So once we get the pattern cut into the stock, we need two lines to get us started. And these lines, they, they have to be straight. Your master lines, because everything else is coming off of these. So we're going to have to get a flexible straight edge, and we're going to have to follow those master lines. We're going to have to do it for each panel. Pistol grip panels and the forehand. And we want those master lines to intersect at exactly the three and a half or three depending on which one you choose. I went with the three and a half to one for my diamonds, for my angle on the pistol grip, but then I went with three to one on the forehand. And that's something visually that's, it doesn't really stand out. But that's, that's, those master lines have to be right because everything else is coming off of those. Okay, and for me this is how I got it started. I'm not going deep. All I want with the master lines, the border lines, everything else, is just a light physical mark in the wood. See, we're not sawing or anything like that. Just a straight line, a smooth curve. Once we do that, all right, we have a variety of cutters here we can use. And these cutters, all they are is just tiny saw blades, and they, they're expensive. Surprisingly so to be just little bitty tiny miniature saw blades. <laughs> There's no demand for these anymore, so they're going to be expensive. And I think that's just part of it. Right, but we have different cutters that we're going to use, and, and the very first one we're going to pick up is a 60 degree cutter. All right, 60 degree cutter is the angle on the end of the cutter. So we basically use a 60 degree and a 90 degree. The 60 degree is going to cut a narrower, narrower channel, curve. There we go. And the 90 degree is going to be much wider. 60 degree, we're, we're going to go over our border. After that, we're going to a spacing cutter. What the spacing cutter does is it has an edge that's going to ride in an existing line and then the cutter offset from that edge. So this is going to give us a line that's parallel to the existing line. And essentially all we're doing is taking the spacing cutter and going from line to line to line to line until all of the lines are cut in one direction and then we're going the opposite way. We're going to go back over all of those lines with our 60 degree cutter and we're going to deepen them right, because the spacing cutter cuts a very shallow line. And for myself, I don't know if it's my tools wore out or, or I'm just not good at this, but what I do is after each I'll cut a line with the spacing cutter. Then I go back immediately and deepen it with the 60 degree cutter. Then I come back with the spacing cutter and cut the next line. And just alternate between these two till all the all of the lines are done in one direction. And then I'll go to the other master line and go in the next direction. 
on that deepening cut though, you don't want to go too deep because if you do, if you go too deep in one direction, when you go to cut your lines in the other direction, it's going to be more difficult because you're going to be hitting all of those lines. So you just want well-defined but fairly shallow lines in one direction. That just makes it easier in the next direction. Once you've got all of the lines cut with, with these cutters, then I'll go back in again with the 60 degree and do another deepening on all of the lines. And that's a pretty straightforward process, and that's essentially the process of checkering. Right. Now for the problems we run into, though, because as simple as that sounded, this process is not that simple. Okay. The first thing, problem, is the corners. These are tough, getting into the corners and these tight spaces, because these cutters are just too big. All right. So there are special cutters that are shorter length that can get us further into these corners but then we can still only get so far so then we have a, a special tool called a vayner for really getting into the tight to get two spots this is a tool that you're just going to have to practice with it's not easy to use and make sure it's sharp or in the case of this really soft spongy walnut I've got from this old stock here, it will tear out a spot. So make, make sure it's just absolutely sharp as it can be. And then take your time in those corners. And I can see now I got a little, little cleanup to do in this one. Okay. Right. Those are our specialty tools. Now we get into the issue of overrun. Overruns, when, when we get to the ends of our lines, it's very easy to go just a little too far in either direction. Right, so when you get to an end of the line, what I do, I make sure my border is well defined and cutting. Then I'll lift up the tip and just use the tip of the cutter and pull back. And then that pull stroke it establishes a line I can work with and then I can slowly deepen it. And that really helps me with overrun. And then we have a border cutting tool. What this border cutting tool does, after we've finished everything, in the case of overrun also, let me say this. All right. Using the method I was saying, picking up the tip and pulling back, that only works this direction. All right, so to get to the, all the ends of the lines in this direction for myself, I rotate the entire stock. So then I, I'm coming at them from this angle as opposed to this, just to finish off those ends of all those lines. It's worth the effort. Now we're going to have some overruns, and that's just part of it. But the fewer you have, the better your end results are going to be. And we have a, a border cutting tool. I have the border already cut on the pistol grip here. What this border cutting tool does is it puts a defined border around it, but that border has a radius and it covers up those overruns. It, it gets rid of them, basically. So this is a great way to hide some of our mistakes. <laughs> but the the best thing to do on any any project like this is don't make the mistake to start with. Then you don't have anything to have to go back and fix. The diamond on the forend here. I do not want a border around it. So I had to be very meticulous to make sure none of the lines around it, that I, I didn't get any overruns from those. This I wanted this perfect. And so far, I, I, it pretty much is. I've still got to come in from a different direction just to clean up on one side, just to get to it from this perfect angle, just to clean up the ends. But that's it, though. I and mean, that's pretty much the process. The only other issue we can run into, or do run into, a lot, when we, our master lines have to be straight. But even putting in our lines using our, our spacing tool, 
we're still not going to be, those lines are not going to be perfectly parallel. You're going to get out of parallel. They're going to get off. Once you get a mistake in there, it is aggravating and it's, you got to be patient getting it out. And you, you have to get it out or those mistakes are just going to keep compounding until it's visible part of the work. And the worst places are the bends. Right? And that's a big part of the purpose of this checkering cradle is so that you can rotate the stock itself and then you can take your cutter and keep going in a straight line, but then rotate the stock to go around the bends in it. And this particular stock is fairly flat on the bottom. It's not as rounded as I would like. I, I rounded it some shaping it, but I could only go so far. The sharper the bends, the more difficult it is, the more issues you're gonna run into. So stop every so often every five or six lines and then take your straight edge and make sure you're staying straight, that your lines are staying straight. And then that's, if it's not, go ahead and start making minor corrections. And what I would do to make my minor corrections, I would take my straight edge, lay it out, and then instead of using the spacing cutter, I would use my knife to mark a line beside the existing so I could look at the two and engage. I didn't want to make a sudden drastic change that was going to show up. I wanted a very small subtle change that would, I could keep making that change over the course of three or four lines until I finally worked out that mistake and got everything back straight. It takes some patience. For this stock here, my final steps to finishing this one, I've got three steps left. I need to go over it with the 90 degree cutter on the 40. And I, I didn't mention that a minute ago, but before you use the border tool, go over it after your deepenings with the 60 degree cutter. We want to use the 90 degree cutter to go over those lines. And then that's really going to open up those lines. And this is going to be our finished cut and the bulk of the pattern. And it's going to get rid of a lot of imperfections also that are in there. It's going to give us really nice, clean, sharp points. This is a fine cut, whereas the 60 degree cutter is a rough cut. And it's just going to clean things up and just give us a nice surface. We just need those deeper lines to work with. All right. Once we've got the lines are finished and we've done everything from every direction, we're done with the lines. Then we go over it with the border tool and then that's going to clean up our overruns. And then finally in the corners where the borders meet, the border tool, we've got two options. We can stop short and then use our cutters and a knife just to clean up the corners because if we want to clear, clearly define border all the way around with no intersections, we've got to stop short just because of the nature of the tool. These are actually two cutters side by side. Or we can continue to go the entire length of this border and intersect the bottom border, in which case it's going to give us a square in each corner. As to what you do, that's up to you. That's individual preference there. I'm going to stop short and then do those corners by hand just to see if I can. Right. And the work of a, this is tricky here, a true professional, they don't need a border because they're not going to have the overrun, so they have the option. I think for me though, adding that border just adds a unique touch, so I'm going to add it. And I didn't. I could actually not use the border on the forend, but I've already done it on the panels for the pistol grips. So I want that symmetry between the two. So yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do the border around this also. And that's pretty much the process of doing a rifle stock. I wanted to show first where I'm at on this process for those of you that have seen some of the things I've done on it in the past is 
This has not been sitting idly in the corner. I have been working behind the scenes on it. But also, since it's not finished and has mistakes, I thought this would be a good one just to show here, uh, those of you that are thinking about trying these things, the problems we run into. Because we're going to run into problems. Uh, anytime we're new to something, learning something, we're going to have problems. Mistakes. The great thing about this is we can just call it character instead of mistakes. <laughs> and I have some character in this one. I have my own unique Tom River flowing lines <laughs> instead of straight. <laughs> and I also have my own unique skipped line pattern. <laughs> For those of you that don't get the joke, there's a, a pattern called skip line checkering where you intentionally skip a line every so often and it gives us a really unique pattern. Just gorgeous pattern. I was referring to the lines I just accidentally skipped. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm pleased with this though. It it was worth the work. This is this is turning into exactly what I'd hoped it would, and I can't wait to do another one. Honestly, it's so time consuming. I'm not sure how long it'll be before I, or if I ever get to do another one. But I I'm happy with this. So I hope this you know, gave you a new appreciation of hand cut checkering and I hope it encourages some of you to go out and try it. God bless and have a good day.